think let's give it a go. And Woo. so welcome everybody. Welcome to our Sabre Chicago featured presentation, the can't miss event of the week. This <laughs> is the captain and me, Chicago style starring Dan Epstein, who's graciously joining us. Uh, I want to introduce my co-host for today. So I'm Jason. Some of you know me through Sabre Chicago. Some of you know me as the co-chair of Sabre's Baseball Cards Research Committee. And yes, that is a real thing. Uh, and so Bill Perch is with me. He is the editor of the best Sabre newsletter in the business. <laughs> I'm not saying that bar was sky high, but no, I'm telling you. Um, <laughs> so he is our newsletter editor, but also the chair of Sabre's Digital Publications Committee. And well, thank you. Uh, yes, so here we are. <laughs> Just give a little bit um, of an outline uh, for you for what we have coming. But first, let me introduce the guest of honor, Dan Epstein. And I can tell you that he has written for Rolling Stone, Spin, Men's Journal, The LA Times, USA Today, Mojo, Guitar World, Revolver, LA Weekly, the forward, so all over the place. His writing yeah. is all over the place. Topics ranging from music to baseball to pop culture to to everything in between, and however those things connect. And I would say I would add right because I was challenging myself in terms of some of Dan's musical writing and his baseball writing. What's the unifying thread? I'm going to say that Dan is a walking, talking, typing celebration of self-expression everywhere it can be found, whether that's on the field on stage or in print, right? Wow, that's, that's uh, a good way of putting it. <laughs> that, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for doing it. Uh, you rewrote and, your bio. <laughs> I know, that, that's awesome. I could keep listing where he's written, but that would use up our, our entire time. Dan has only uh, agreed to be with us for four hours today, so I need to, uh, <laughs> talk fast um, or, or say less. But uh, at any rate, uh, three, three books, three full-length books, that I'm aware of all on the subject of baseball in 2010. And this is of course an absolute baseball classic, maybe even a Mount Rushmore level baseball classic, Big Hair and Plastic Grass. And I'll give the subtitle of Funky Ride Through Baseball in America in the Swinging 1970s. Um, probably the most fun I've ever had reading a baseball book for, for a guy who kind of came of age in baseball at the end of the seventies with the, with the Pirates winning the World Series and all that and only knowing kind of the first part of the decade through my baseball cards. Um, I got to admit, I always thought I grew up in the best time of baseball. I read the book and I'm like, damn, I just missed it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, 2014, 20, so that was in 2010. 2014, Stars and Strikes always has the best titles. Um, baseball in America in the Bicentennial, Summer of 76. And then uh, near and dear to our hearts here for this presentation, uh, just this past April, I think, was when it first yeah. came out. Yeah, That's this April. past April. The captain and me on and off the field with Thurman Munson. And the me in this case isn't Dan himself, but in fact, the first DH, Ron Bloomberg. So uh, what's our outline for today? That was the welcome and the introductions and everything like that. Um, so we will uh, start off really focused on Dan's latest book, The Captain and Me. Bill and I have some, some questions uh, we've, we've put together for that. Um, we will then segue a bit to just 70s baseball in general, and I think I advertised to some of you that Dan will be naming here, I believe, for the very first time, maybe the last, uh, his all 1970s uh, funky baseball lineup. So uh, we hope to have plenty of time for questions for all of you as well. So with that, I am going to, if it's okay, kick it off. Bill and I are kind of going to take turns teaming up on Dan. Uh, so Dan... I am just going to start with the title, The Captain and Me, right? Which, which we'll say comes from the Doobie Brothers album and the Doobie Brothers being a favorite of Thurman. I'm, I'm curious because the title felt so clever for the book that you wrote. Um, did the title almost come first? And then you're like, oh my God, that would be a crazy, awesome title for a book about Thurman Munson and somebody else. Let me go find somebody. Or, yeah. or like, when did that come? What was the inspiration? Just well, the, the inspiration was, um, you know, Ron and I had already decided to do this book about uh, uh, his friendship with Thurman and their time together on the Yankees. And we were, we, t we realized uh, in the course of our conversations that uh, we're both, you know, very into music. Ron didn't know that I was a big music head. I didn't know that Ron had 
you know, Ron grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, went to see James Brown, went to see Otis Redding. He was really into uh, 60s soul music. And, and um, when, and we talk about it in the book that Ron and Thurman became very good friends uh, with Nat Tarnapal, who was the president of Brunswick Records, which was a huge soul label in the 60s and 70s, Jackie Wilson, Shy Lights, et cetera, et cetera. And so Ron and I started talking about music and I was like, well, you know, what did, what kind of music was Thurman into? Because we, you know, we all know the famous story of Thurman cranking Neil Diamond on a boom box during a Yankees flight and completely pissing Billy Martin off uh, with it. But, you know, it's like, what else other than Neil Diamond did Thurman listen to? And, and Ron said, well, you know, he was, he was, you know, Ron described it as, as country rock. Uh, and, and I was like, well, what do you mean by that? And he was like, well, you know, Creedence Clearwater Revival, Almond Brothers, uh, Doobie Brothers. And then it started coming out that like when they would go on the road, Thurman would always like look for Doobie Brothers cassettes. Uh, they're all very into cassettes because of course they're very compact and you could just like grab a few at a store while you're on the road and, and uh, listen to them in your hotel room. And uh, so as soon as he said a Doobie Brothers, I immediately thought, okay, Captain and me, that's gotta be the title because it's, <laughs> You know, it's, you know, Ron makes a big point that though Thurman was officially named the Yankee captain in 1976, he had essentially been the captain of the Yankees since his first uh, full season, 1970, uh, with the team. And, you know, was really this this very respected leader figure, uh, even as a rookie. And so it just seemed like, uh, OK, th this is what it's got to be. And. And uh, it took a little convincing, uh, but, but Ron eventually was into it and uh, I think is happy uh, uh, in retrospect. Well done. You know, if, if, if Ron backed out, you would have had to get uh, Tony Tennille and then you right. could have <laughs> Yeah, we, 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 got to, we, got some, we got some Tony Tennille jokes uh, when, when it was first announced. So, uh, I, you know, hopefully that'll be my next book. <laughs> we'll buy it. We'll buy it. Bill, take it away. It's a good plan B, yeah. Well, I'm glad you talked a little bit about music and, and that connection, but uh, specifically with the contact through Nat, it, it really seemed like the Yankees of that era had a strong connection to the music world. And through Nat, it actually brought them fairly close to, to organized crime. Yes. And it, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, because when you think about the 70s, it, it, I don't think we'll ever see an era like that again, uh, for a lot of good reasons, a lot of bad reasons, whatever. But I was wondering if you could just kind of tell us a little bit more about that. Maybe if, if a little bit more of those stories had come through and you kind of had to make a, a decision of, of how you share it or not. Yeah, I mean, uh, Ron has a lot of Nat stories. Nat was a huge figure for both him and Thurman. Nat really took both of them under his wing, uh, was always taking them out to dinner at various uh, New York hotspots. Um, and also various Italian restaurants that were frequented by uh, a certain well-known uh, le legitimate businessman. And uh, yeah, I mean, Nat's world really, you know, I mean, the music business in general in the 1960s and 70s was pretty heavily mobbed up. And Nat was very much of that world. Um, so, yeah, I actually did have to cut a lot of Nat stuff from the book because it just felt like it was, you know, I, I, I felt like we, we had some good stories that sort of put that point across. But there is there is a lot of stuff about, you know, them hanging out and various mobsters coming over to the house uh, and Nat's place, you know, all hanging out around the pool, eating hamburgers. Uh, uh, um, there was one story, I'm trying to remember the exact details, but Nat was also like um, tight with all, all the car, the, you know, the big luxury car dealerships in the tri-state area, which, you know, I think there was some mob overlap there too. And the, there was some story about like um, some, uh, uh, one of these car dealers being at, at Nat's pool and you know, some mobster pulling the hairpiece off the guy and, and tossing it in the pool and much hilarity ensued and, and stuff like that. But, you know, things like this, like Ron and Thurman were very much just kind of witnesses to it. They, I think Thurman had a little better idea than Ron did of who these people were and what they were capable of. Um, 
But, you know, Ron makes it very clear that you know, all these mob guys really worshiped the Yankees and they really, you know, it was a kick for them to be able to hang out with Ron and Thurman and to be able to talk baseball with them. And, you know, they would have never done anything to them that would have put them in a compromising position or in any way have uh, diminished their ability to play well for the Yankees. So, you know, it was very much like, you know, that they were, they were, you know, like little kids around them. They, they just, you know, wanted to, to talk baseball and, and nobody ever talked about who was going to get whacked or, 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 you know, what, you know, we, we, we got a bunch of fur coats on a truck come in or anything like that. That was all very, you know, I think Nat, Nat did live a fairly lavish lifestyle. And at one point we talk about this in the book, uh, decided to show Thurman and Ron his, his home vault, which was like you know, secluded in, in, in the center of his house. And, you know, you could walk into it and it was just, the shelves were just like stacked with, you know, stacks of cash and, and jewelry and watches and, you know, probably gold bars, you know, who knows. But uh, so, yeah, so it, it's, you know, and, and this is something I hadn't realized uh, until Ron told me about it. And, and I uh, then, you know, did some research about it was that, Nat, Nat really wanted to buy the Yankees. He wanted to, um, you know, when CBS announced that they were putting the team up for sale, Nat was all in. He had the money. Uh, he, he was a, a season ticket holder. He was there at virtually every game. He, he knew the players. He was uh, best pals with Dick Williams. He wanted to bring Dick in to, you know, this is pre-Steinbrenner. He wanted to bring uh, Dick Williams in to manage the Yankees. And, um, you know, the Yankees didn't seriously entertain his, his offer because they, they knew that there was no way uh, the other MLB owners would sign off on a guy from the record business and, and uh, you know, one with, with so many obvious gangland ties uh, to, to, to buy the Yankees. Cool. Yeah, and I'm going to go back to the title, The Captain and Me, and ask the <laughs> same question. just can't leave it alone. <laughs> <huh? laughs> but, but a different question, but a different question. So, um, right, so the, the book um, probably feel, feels like it's a lot more Captain than me, right? Um, you know, kind of more, more Thurman. And I'm wondering if that's something that kind of evolved during the writing, or if that was kind of Ron's Ron's goal from the start, and it, it reminds me a little bit of the Cobra book that just came out from Dave Parker and Dave Jordan, that there's such a focus just on relationships, teammates, brotherhood, almost more than, than Dave Parker just wanted to kind of tell the story of himself, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, well, well, there are, there are a couple of things behind that. One, um, Ron already wrote a book about his own career called Designated Hebrew, and, right. and I saw so I was a great title. And I was really, you know, I really didn't, didn't want to retread too much of that. I didn't want to make it seem like, you know, like designated here, you know, Hebrew part two now with added Thurman, you know, it's just really wanted to. Uh, um, and, and the thing is, too, like like when Ron and I first started talking about doing a book together, this wasn't necessarily the idea that he approached me with. But once we started talking about his time in the Yankees and his friendship with Thurman. I had no idea that they were that close. And then he was telling me all sorts of things about Thurman as a human being that I also had no idea about. I mean, Thurman was, I was not a Yankees fan growing up. I still am not, but um, Thurman was my first favorite catcher. I saw him hit a home run at the very first major league game I ever attended, which was May 30th, 1976 at Tiger Stadium. And, you know, even at the age of 10, I could just tell, like, this was a guy who completely took control on the field, was, co you know, he, he was larger than life. Um, you know, I, I could tell he was one of the greats, but everything I ever read about him in the press in those days was all like, he's gruff, he's mean, he's, you know, he's hard nosed, he's a really good player, but he's, you know, he's combative as a person and, you know, he won't talk to the press and he hates Reggie Jackson and blah, blah, blah. And when Ron, you know, Ron was telling me about, about their friendship and, you know, certainly how much of a role Thurman played uh, both in kind of helping Ron acclimate to the big leagues, 
but also uh, when, you know, in 75, when Ron starts to get injured all the time and, and eventually winds up sitting out for two and a half seasons. Um, and, and Thurman is really the only guy in that period who's constantly, you know, at Ron's side saying, you know, you know, you work harder, Bloomy. You, you're going to come back. You're going to join it. You know, we need you on the field. You're going to join us. It's going to be great. You know, your career's not over. And, and that really impressed me to, to learn that because, you know, I know that some baseball players are by and large a, a superstitious bunch um, and that a lot of them don't want to be around a player who's on the DL all the time or, you know, at the very least, they start to resent the fact that, hey, this guy hasn't played in two months yet. He's on the training table and, you know, uh, and, and yet I'm going to go out there and, and play today. And this guy's just going to sit here and, you know, get, get his legs rubbed down. What's, what's the deal? And, you know, and so during that time, Ron was very much kind of um, an outcast on the Yankees. And uh, certainly by 1977, like, you know, pretty much he, he felt alienated from pretty much the entire team and certainly from Billy Martin. And yet uh, Thurman was really the only guy, I mean, I think Catfish Hunter to an extent, but it was really Thurman who every day was, you know, with him, checking in with him, trying to uplift his spirits. And it's like, damn, this is not the Thurman Munson that I know. And I'm going to wager that most people don't know this Thurman Munson and we should write this book so people, people learn about it. Awesome. Yeah, well, and, and along those lines, I mean, talking about on the field, it really comes across in the book that Thurman had a very good sense of the game. Uh, he knew very early on that he was responsible for basically everything, working with established pitchers, working with the young ones coming up. And and that's a lot placed on a, a relatively young ball player um but as the book continues it, it really stressed that he had that good sense um how other pitchers would work him you know first time through the order second third time like that and catchers traditionally have turned into good managers right. and toward the end of the book i mean obviously you know there's a lot of speculation what it, a lot of what ifs that come along with him but toward the end of the book, it said that there was really no intention of managing or coaching or anything like that. And obviously we'll never know if that would have changed over a couple of years, but how do you think he would have translated to a manager role, embracing analytics? Because it, at certain points it mentioned that, that you know, pitchers would track and they would, they would get all that data. And he would, for the most part, be like, no, 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 I already get a sense of it. I don't need it. Right. So you're kind of at that, sense of he knew how the game worked but then not necessarily embracing the information that was there so right yeah I, I mean I think you know Ron feels like like Thurman would not have wanted to manage because because Thurman hated talking to reporters and mm -hmm. and so to have you know have to have a have a, a meeting with the reporters after every game would have driven him absolutely nuts uh, the uh, also, he constantly fought with Steinbrenner, and so, you know, if, you know, the, the theory would be had Thurman lived, he would have been a Yankee manager. But managing, you know, as it was, he and Steinbrenner were often at each other's throats, and like the idea of of Steinbrenner calling Thurman in the dugout every day to to to, to uh, try to manage, you know, overmanage uh, what was happening on the field. You know, it, it's really hard for me to picture Thurman buying into that. I, you know, I've, at the same time, I think, you know, baseball was clearly in his blood and I think it would have been hard for him to completely divorce himself from the game. I think probably a more realistic, um, scenario would have been that he would have become say the coach at Kent State or some you know some some college team where the you know the, the spotlight wasn't on him as intensely where he didn't have to constantly justify his moves to the press or to you know the owners and he could have just imparted his love and his knowledge of the game 
which, you know, I think he really, I, th I think there was a part of him that really, truly enjoyed that. And that, that really, you know, he was that guy in the dugout who would, you know, snap, snap other players to attention if they're goofing around and go like, no, no, look at that guy. Look at what he's doing. You're going to need to remember this when you face him again, three months from now. And uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I, if Ron kind of, uh, Ron thinks Thurman would have been more of a, you know, because he was so into the business side of things that he would have wound up buying into a team, you know, of like maybe as a partner buying into the ownership of, of uh, the Indians or something like that. But, but I, I personally, I see him more uh, you know, going the, uh, going the college baseball route. Dan, we're going to compare eras a little bit, I guess. So, so Thurman Munson uh, himself flipped off Yankee fans. <laughs> <laughs> that were booing him, and uh, and I think if, if if I recall, got either a standing ovation or got cheered uh, pretty loudly uh, his next time at bat. Uh, Javi Baez famously uh, this season uh, gave thumbs down boos to uh, to Mets fans <laughs> after they were riding the team pretty hard, and uh, he he was definitely persona non grata for a good week until uh, until he had a walk off uh, right. hit in a big game. Um, but maybe there's a lot to unpack, but, uh, what, what do you, what do you see maybe that, what was it about Thurman Munson that he could do that and, and get cheers? Whereas a guy like Javi Baez does it and, and, uh, the fans are just on top of him for, for a good week. Well, I, I think there's, I think, I mean, obviously there's a difference in eras and fans relationship to the game and also the way stuff gets blown up on, on the news. Uh, but I think w in Thurman's case, Thurman had been a Yankee for six seasons at that point, um, maybe seven. And uh, so, you know, he, Thurman had already firmly established himself as the day in, day out uh, catcher of the Yankees. Uh, he was, you know, whereas Javi had only, how long had he, had he been a Met? Like, three weeks at that point yeah. uh yeah, so i healthy <laughs> yeah yeah so i i think you know it, it's kind of like you know thurman was family and 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 i think also that time in new york you know 70s new york is a tough place everybody's just kind of you know doing what they have to do to get along and you know and there's there's you know, you watch any movie that takes place in New York in the 1970s and, you know, everybody's breaking each other's balls. Everybody's, uh, you know, you know, the, the, the Dustin Hoffman, hey, I'm walking here type of thing. And so I think Thurman's, you know, Thurman's uh, raised middle finger salute to the fans was really just an extension of that. Like, hey, I'm working here, you know? Yeah, okay, I messed up, but like, you know, I, I've, but I've been the guy for six or seven years. What, what are you doing? And so the next, you know, next game he comes back and, you know, it had been all over the papers as, you know, this sort of outrageous thing that Thurman had done. But I think the fans understood it as like, yeah, he's frustrated. I would have done the same. You get on me at work. You know, I've been here, um, you know, on the construction site for a year and I've been doing great. And finally, you know, I screwed something up and you're on my case and yeah, I'm going to give you the finger. So I think it, 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 it was seen in that light is just like, you know, he's a working guy like us. Yeah. We all have our bad days and he just picked a particularly colorful way of expressing it. Nice. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm looking at your uh, background in old Comiskey park and in Chicago, we obviously had the chance to see the second half of Carlton Fisk's career and throughout the book, it, it really stresses that, you know, sometimes you can have a competitive relationship with a, a, a player, similar position, you know, maybe, you know, uh, two different quarterbacks that are big at the same time. And, you know, so obviously in the American league, you have Yankees Red Sox leading into this Munson Fisk relationship that, that really my sense of it wasn't, it wasn't so much competitive as there was pure hatred between them. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, they really like, I think it was, was on a very visceral level. They were so, you know, pretty much all that they had in common was that they were excellent catchers uh, playing in the American league. Beyond that, it was just like, 
Uh, you know, Thurman hated the way uh, Fisk, he felt that Fisk was a pretty boy, that, that Fisk, you know, like, like when, when Fisk would come up to bat against the Yankees, Thurman would always throw dirt on his shoes and his pants just because he knew that annoyed him, that, that he wanted his uniform to be spotless. Whereas Thurman was like pig pen, you know, he would just like walk out on the field and all of a sudden his, his uh, uniform would be completely caked in, the, in, in infield mud. And, uh, you know, and, and, and I think Thurman felt that, you know, part of it too was that Thurman won the Rookie of the Year award in 1970 and then Fisk comes up and wins the Rookie of the Year award. So there's automatically all these comparisons in the press. So I think that and all these questions that would be put to Thurman by reporters like, you know, what do you think about Fisk? And I think that really stuck in his craw. Um, but, you know, and I think I think Fisk really hated Thurman. I, 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 I haven't, you know, haven't spoken to him about this, so I can't say for sure. But it seemed like, you know, it was really like, um, you know, they just it, it was like two dogs who just instantly hate each other on site. And, uh, you know, and I think that, you know, Ron makes the point in the book, and I think it's true, like, you know, what we think of as, uh, you know, the way we view the Yankees-Red Sox rivalry really goes back to that, to the Munson-Fisk rivalry. It's really, you know, before that, like, the Red Sox and Yankees were rarely in competition uh, in the American League. I mean, they, they, obviously, they played each other all the time, but there were, it, there were rarely times where the, where both teams were in contention, and so you get you get into the '70s, and all of a sudden both teams are starting to make noise in the AL East, and they both have you know the two best catchers in the American League, and 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 those guys hate each other, and it it it, it results in these you know very colorful fights on the field, and 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 then it really kind of works its way into the 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 fandom, and we talk about this in the book that that. You know, going to Fenway or going to Yankee Stadium for a Yankees Red Sox game in those days, like that's when you really started to see the fans just going after each other, and and like e even the players' wives would go at it. And you know, and I, I think if you look back in the '60s and before, you don't you don't see that level of enmity there. So let's do this, Dan. We asked you a bunch of questions. We have a bunch more, but. Uh, if we didn't already make you lose your voice, and I see you're hydrating, that'll help us here. But would you be willing to read a little bit of the book to this? Group? Absolutely, yeah. And and Good. and where this book I think especially ties in with the Chicago chapter is that, as I'm sure most of you remember, uh, Ron Bloomberg's final days as a major league player were spent with the Chicago White Sox, and. Um, you know, th this is an interesting thing, too, because this was an interesting thing for me as well, because I just remember Ron as being, you know, this quote unquote free agent bust that, you know, in 1977, the White Sox had the Southside Hitman, uh, uh, Richie Zisk and Oscar Gamble leading the way. And then they went off to free agency following that season. And Ron Bloomberg and Bobby Bonds were supposed to be their uh, their replacements, essentially, and neither of them really worked out. And uh, so, but again, talking to Ron, I got a little more sense of like, you know, what led him to go to the White Sox, why he, you know, why he ended up there. And so uh, I'm going to read to you uh, some pages from, uh, from a chapter in the book called A Fresh Start, which uh, goes into all that. And uh, amusingly enough, uh, Ron's first game, uh, uh, first game in a White Sox uniform takes place at Yankee Stadium. So here we go. It's like some weird dream. I'm back at Yankee Stadium for opening day 1978. My boyhood heroes, Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris are there. And the sold out crowd goes crazy as they're driven out onto the field. They present the World Series trophy to New York Mayor Ed Koch, who everybody boos. Thurman, Reggie, Mickey, Catfish, Sparky, Gator, everybody's lined up on the field, looking good in their fresh pinstripes, feeling proud as their world championship flag flaps in the April breeze out in center field and ready to play some baseball. I'm ready to play too. 
but I'm standing on the other side of the field from all of them in a different uniform. By the end of the 77 season, I was 29 years old. My knee was getting stronger, though it wasn't anywhere near 100%. And I knew I still had some gas left in the tank as a player. But I also knew that after two and a half years in the trainer's room at Yankee Stadium, I needed to go somewhere else. A lot of people can't play in New York. They can't handle the pressure, the media, the intensity of the fans. But I was one of those guys who could play in New York, who wanted to play in New York, who loved everything about the place. But I hadn't been able to play in New York the last couple of years because of all the injuries. And it was affecting how some people saw me and how I saw myself. I had to make a change, if only for mental purposes. The 77 season felt like a rerun of a really bad TV show and I couldn't bear to watch it again. When I declared as a free agent, all hell broke loose in the Yankees front office. George called me up and said, how in the hell can you do this? We stuck by you for three years. We sent you out to LA to get your shoulder done. We gave you a raise every year. You're part of this team and with your popularity, you need to be here. Gabe Paul called me, Billy called me, even Elston Howard called me and they're all really angry with me. George got even angrier when he learned that the Mets wanted to sign me. I had a meeting with Donald, Donald Grant and Sheldon Stone, who was my agent at the time. The Mets wanted to give me a four-year deal, but, but that wasn't solving the problem of leaving the Yankees. I couldn't stay in the same city and go to the Mets. Plus, I didn't want to play at Shea again. I needed a city change. So I went to Chicago to meet with White Sox owner Bill Veck. He was an unbelievable man. What a sweetheart he was and what a character. During my initial meeting with him and Sheldon, he was smoking cigarettes and then stubbing them out, stubbing out the butts in an ashtray he'd built in his wooden leg. I went down to Comiskey Park and Vec brought some of the ballplayers in to meet me, like some of the ballplayers in to meet me, like Steve Stone, Wilbur Wood, Eric Soderholm, and Chet Lemon. These guys all lived in Chicago during the off season and they all told me what a great town it was and how much fun the 77 season had been for them in Chicago. Becca offered me a guaranteed four-year contract for $650,000. Before I signed my contract, I called Thurman up in Canton. And I said, Thurman, you're my brother. Here's what they offered me. Before I take it, I'm asking you, what would you do? He started laughing and screaming, take it, take it. But then he asked me, do you feel comfortable there? Are you healthy? Because if I'm not healthy, then I'm taking someone else's money. And he knew I wouldn't feel good about that. I told him, yes, I'm healthy, but I still have some problems with my knee. Hopefully it'll be back to 100% by spring. He said, Chicago's a great town. They, they have a pretty good ball team. They ripped our heads off a few times last year. It's not like New York, Bloomy, but if you feel comfortable there, go for it. When George found out that I was about to sign with the White Sox, he called me up and offered me the same amount. I thanked him, but I told him that I just couldn't do it. I told him that with the Yankees, I felt like I was a piece of used property that's been sent out to the junkyard. Now I was feeling energized by this new opportunity in Chicago. Plus, I really loved Bill Beck. So I was like, I've got to make the change. I loved George. He was like a second father to me in many ways. And I felt terrible about leaving him and leaving New York, but I had to go. So I'm going to fast forward to the next chapter, uh, Like a Bad Dream, um, which also involves Bill Veck um, and, and Ron's last, uh, last moments as a White Sox player. The last time I ever saw Thurman was in March 79 at spring training. The Yankees came to Sarasota to play an exhibition game against us and we went to Fort Lauderdale a few days later to play them. Thurman played in both games. I didn't play in either of them. We sat down and talked about our winters. He'd taken up flying like he talked about during the summer. He'd finally cleared it with George and he'd even brought, bought himself a plane. Right off the bat, I thought this was a bad idea. I loved Thurman like a brother and I trusted him, but you couldn't have paid me any amount of money to go up with him in a small plane. Knowing Thurman as I did, it was too easy for me to picture him saying, watch me do this, watch me do that. Somebody told me I couldn't do this, so I'm going to do it. 
there was a devilish side to him, and I sure didn't want to see it come out when he was in the cockpit. Not that I would have gone up in a small plane with anyone else either, but I thought, I thought of Thurman as a brother and a teammate, not a pilot. He asked me how I was doing, and I said, I'm slowing down. I'm getting injections in my knees and shoulder. I think I'm breaking apart now. I'm hitting the ball sometimes, but I'm, not, I'm really not playing up to my expectations. I'd been working out all winter, but I was still struggling at the plate. If I make it to the end of the season, I told him, I'll be really lucky. He nodded. Whatever you do, Bloomy, I'm with you. I'm for you. He said that his knees and back were getting more beat up. He told me to keep in contact with him, whatever happens, and let him know what was going on. He gave me a goodbye hug after the second game and told me, I'll see you during the season. But it never got that far. I was released by the White Sox the next day. I'd had a fairly good spring with the White Sox, but I was hurting. My shoulder was bad, my knee was bad, and I could only run the bases at maybe half the speed I used to. Things were clearly going downhill. Just how downhill became apparent became clear one day when I was taking BP before a game in Sarasota, and all of a sudden Bill Vett walked out onto the field. He was hopping around on his wooden leg, saying hello to everybody. Lamar Johnson was over at first base fielding grounders, and he's talking to Lamar while I'm taking some swings. All of a sudden, I hit a line drive to first, and Bill stuck his wooden leg out to stop it. The ball hit his leg and just dropped to the ground. Back in the day, when I was hitting the ball really hard, a line, dri a line drive off my bat would have taken his wooden leg right off. But this time, the ball hit his leg and just plopped softly into the dirt right in front of him. People were dying laughing, and that's the moment I knew I was going to be released. I knew I was done. Sure enough, Bill and Roland Heeman took me into the office soon afterward, and they gave me my release. I really couldn't blame them. I would have released me too. That's a great, that's a great, great story. Um, <laughs> I know, I love the image of the ball hitting Vex peg leg and just, <laughs> just, <dying. laughs> just with the ashtray in it <laughs> right yeah, exactly <laughs> um so let me let me uh we'll keep it in chicago but i'm gonna uh this will be a question really about you dan is you've spent some time here there, there were there were uh in the book uh the gentleman frequented some delis and things like that do you do you have some deli recommendations from your time in chicago you know i really um it's uh, well the place I used to go to all the time, long gone, uh, was the Belton Corn Beef Center at uh, Fullerton and Clark. I'm not sure Ron ever went there, but I went to school uh, literally uh, a half block away from that place. So that was like after school, after school dances, after uh, play rehearsals. Uh, that, that was probably between the ages of uh, 14 and 18, uh, the place I I, I frequented the most in Chicago, but you know, I, 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 my dad lives in New York City, which is where I was born, and I always felt that that New York had a much stronger deli culture than than Chicago did. There were always uh, um, uh, Freddie Threepwood is just uh, suggested Samuel's, which I'm not familiar with, but the. Uh, um, yeah, it's, it, 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 you know, for, for I would always go visit my dad and we would, you know, there would be a whole list of delis we would hit up, uh, you know, for various things, but I, I didn't have that, uh, that same experience growing up in Chicago. No, I got you. All right, uh, Bill, yeah. what you got? What you got? Yeah, just a general um, 1970s question. Obviously, I've had a chance to to read all of your books and you have such a passion for the 1970s and write so well about 70s baseball and culture and I and I think it, it 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 weaves into the baseball stories really well you know and, and I think I mentioned earlier you know we're never going to quite see a time like that again but I was wondering if you can compare 70s baseball to today and maybe give us a little bit of a pro and con of each era um not to well, totally put you on the spot there, but yeah. I, okay, I think I think the one pro of of the current era that that well, okay, two pros. One uh, that there is more 
uh, weight being given to analytics and uh, you know understanding of or, or just of how analytics can expand your understanding of the game and what players can do and how they should be used. I think that's really cool. I think, you know, I, I, uh, I, I know a lot of players who played in the seventies are still very resistant to that idea. You know, like we were talking about, you know, Thurman wasn't, you know, wasn't the kind of guy to look at the scouting reports or the, the, uh, pitch logs or anything like that. He, you know, he absorbed it and, you know, it wasn't about, about looking at, at a sheet of numbers, but I, you know, as somebody who was always into baseball stats, uh, you know, as a kid, I think like, yeah, that's, that's cool that, that, that there's more acceptance and, and use of that. Now, I also think it's great that players are getting, at least in the majors are getting a much more equitable slice of the financial pie. I think, um, you know, we talk about this in the book that the, you know, the players strike in 72 and the lockout in 76. And there was all this question of, of what, um, you know, but the players didn't understand, uh, I mean, the, what, um, uh, how their lives could be that much better, how, the, how they could actually, you know, that the, there was a life beyond this kind of like, you know, go hat in hand to management at the beginning of every new season and beg for ten thousand dollars more. You know that the, they they were in a much stronger uh, uh, pos- bargaining position than 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 they knew. And I think all you know all the labor stuff in in baseball during the seventies really resulted in what we see today with with players you know making you know and, and I know a lot of fans have have a problem with players making that much money or think that if they're making that much money, they should be performing like Superman on, on the field. But I, but I feel like if, you know, if there is money to be made, I want to see it go to the players because I don't go to the ballpark to cheer on the owners. Um, I don't go to the ballpark to watch the owners. I, uh, you know, I, the, the, the game is about the players. So I think those are the two, those are the two things that I think, you know, where there's definitely an advantage of, you know, modern baseball versus, the 70s everything else uh i'm on team 70s i think it was a much more interesting game it's a much more fun game it was a much uh, there's more action um again i don't love astroturf but the type of baseball that was played on astroturf was a very exciting type of baseball especially when you had teams like the royals and the phillies that really built their teams around fast guys who made you know Uh, made contact and uh, could turn a single into a triple like that. And, you know, really uh, flashy uh, in the, in the field. And, you know, I, and I don't want to be an, an off, you know, get off my lawn type of guy, but I also feel like players back then had a much greater sense of fundamentals and, and a much, you know, they, they could do a lot more at the plate than just, in a swing for the fences and that uh, there was a lot more sort of in-game, you know, recalibration of like, okay, I went up last time, you know, in this situation. So I'm going to take a completely different approach and, you know, in this next situation. Uh, And, and I don't see that as much these days. Yeah. And I, and I have to say too, with the seventies, the uniforms, there was a little (laughs) bit more of stepping out because what was it? I think it was in, um, in uh, big hair and plastic grass. I think you used the line retina searing uniforms. (laughs) Houston Astros. Yeah. And and yeah. Oh yeah. The, the uniforms are far more superior. The players, you know, I, I know that like, there's a lot of players now who like, you know, wear the big beards or have like the, the, the long hair, but I, I felt like like the the modes of self expression were a lot uh, more interesting and fun. And in you know, it wasn't like okay, well, you know, I'm not like everybody else, so I'm going to go up and look like a complete slob. You know, it was like you know, Oscar Gamble was very proud of his afro. It wasn't like you know, I'm just, it, it wasn't like he was going up there all nappy headed. He like it was you know, fully combed out and slick and and yeah, I, I just think. Um, the and and then of course ticket prices you know the fact that like you know i could go to games in the 70s 
you know, with my mom, who was not making much money at all, we could, you know, take the whole family to Dodger Stadium a couple times a summer. It was, you know, it was easy. Um, and now just like, you know, the, the sheer amount of money that you have to spend to even be there. And then, then, then the experience is so much about what's happening on the scoreboard. And, you know, it's, it just, it's, it's, I, I just feel like so much of, so much of the soul has been sucked out of the game in exchange for short-term profit opportunities. And, mm -hmm. and we see that with, you know, I think that we, you know, what's happening now with the, you know, the gambling partnerships and all that, it's just, it's, it's gross. It's, it's really, it, it, it takes so much of the magic away from the game for me. Sure. Well, in that case, this might be a good time to turn back the clock. Uh, let's say, 50 to 40 ish years. Dan, are you ready to offer up your all funky 1970s all star team, starting with the catcher? Who do you have behind the plate? I got Manny Sengi in. I think, <laughs> uh, I think, you know, for a couple of reasons. He, you know, here was a guy who would swing at anything, anywhere it was. So very funky approach at the plate. His approach behind the plate, he had that weird crouch with uh, with one leg out, which you know was definitely unorthodox for the time. And and there's a there's a picture I think it's from a Pirates yearbook uh, where he's wearing his batting helmet with a knit sort of I, I guess it's like a tam o shanter on top of that. And I still am dying to know what the story is behind that. But that that right there, I mean, even though Ted Simmons looked completely stoned on about half of his tops cards from the 70s you know which which brings him into contention it's it's manny all the way fantastic how about at first base who do you have for us this is a real tough one because um i was originally leaning george boomer scott because you know he was he was the guy out there with the necklace of second baseman's teeth uh brilliant fielder uh was the one who really brought the term tater back into a uh, uh, common colloquial usage. But uh, in the end, I got to go with Dick Allen because anybody who appears on the cover of Sports Illustrated uh, juggling baseballs while smoking a cigarette and probably had at least one cocktail before that picture was taken, I think, uh, you know, aside from his brilliance as a ball player, I, th I think he belongs. Well, you get full approval from the Chicago crowd. <laughs> Oh, uh, what about what about second base, a position not normally thought of as funky? It, this is a tough one, too. I mean, I thought about Jim Morgan because of his he had that, you know, that 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 funky pump. Um, but I am at, at the plate. But then, you know, years of listening to his uh, him uh, nattering on uh, as a broadcaster really sort of made me realize how unfunky he actually was. So I'm going to go with Davy Lopes because he had the total uh, Cheech Marin uh, mustache, which uh, um, I think that that uh, was massively funky in and of itself. And then also just you know, brilliant on the base paths. I, I would add, you know, as someone who consumes 70s baseball, mostly through baseball cards, just off baseball cards. Uh, Tito Fuentes, probably. Um, you know what? That's that. I that okay. You, I um, I'm taking it away from Davy and I'm giving it to Tito. I can't oh. believe I spaced on Tito. Yes, <laughs> the headbands on the the headbands on the cap, the bat flip. Yeah, Tito all the way. Right. Sorry, with Sorry the sharpie sharpie yeah. writing his name. Yeah. Okay. How about how about third base? Who do you have for us? Um, I, I'm good. You know, I wanted to give it to Steve Onaveris's toupee, but I think that's. Uh, I, I think we need to give it to a full full ball player. And so it would be Bill Mad Dog Madlock at third base. Very nice. Very nice. And at short. Uh, it, it, this was pretty obvious to me. I think we got to go with Gary Templeton. I think, uh, you know, ju jump steady. Uh, also uh, a man known for giving the finger to the fans. Uh, but but so much fun to watch in the, in, in the field. And, you know, and I love that, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he was a switch hitter, but he changed changed it up late in the 79 season so that he could get 100, uh, 100 hits from each side of the plate. But some up, somewhere somebody miscounted, and it turns out like he didn't actually achieve that, even though for years we've been saying he had. So, yeah, I think, I think he's our shortstop for sure. 
some guy at Sabre ruined it, man. Yeah, <laughs> you guys. <laughs> so, so let me ask this, speaking of shortstop, and, and I have to acknowledge a longstanding uh, cosmetological debate over, uh, over whether a perm counts as a fro, but is it fair to say that the least funky player with a fro in baseball history might have been shortstop Larry Boa? Yeah, that, that's, that's true. Although I think, yeah. Um, although I, I think you could also make a case for Mike Schmidt. I mean, my, Schmidt, you know, Schmidt had the, had the, the red perm fro, uh, obviously great player, but uh, that there, there, again, back to the yearbooks, there's this great picture of him with his wife and their kids. And it's just like, you know, three intense redheads in one picture. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's not funky at all, folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, then the Don, Don Sutton's family's calling me. They want, they want right, yeah. <laughs> justice for Sutton. <laughs> now, this, this is probably the most difficult decision making you had to do. Fortunately, I'm going to give you three picks, but who do you have in the outfield? Yeah, the, actually, you know, it wasn't that difficult. Uh, there was one difficult. Well, OK, first of all, let me preface this by, by saying I, uh, our designated hitter will be Oscar Gamble, because okay. uh, I think, you know, in order to uh, clearly a very funky man and to include him in uh, in this lineup, uh, we, we need to have him at DH. Uh, right field, obviously, Dave Parker, the Cobra, uh, you know, anybody who would wear a custom made uh, T-shirt with Parliament lyrics on it into the uh, Pirates clubhouse uh, to try to pump, pump the teammates up. I think uh, yeah, he, he earns it right there. Plus the, you know, the, I, I wear a star of David because my name is David and I'm a star. Uh, <laughs> that's, 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 uh, that, that is all-star funkiness for sure. Uh, center field would be Gary Maddox, a uh, huge fro. Uh, one of the first guys to wear the mutton shops on the field, which was because uh, his, face was unfortunately scarred by agent orange or some other uh you know chemical warfare agent uh during vietnam and uh so it, it was painful for him to shave so that's why he, he he grew that out and of course just watching him play was uh, uh watching him uh, cover center field was was you know a thing of of musical beauty uh left field this was where it got tough because Willie Stargell was my initial um, pick because, you know, he was obviously funky in many ways. There's some great photos of him getting down at, uh, with his friends at, at various house parties in the, in the seventies off the field, he dressed uh, kind of like Curtis Mayfield uh, complete with the, you know, the hat and the leather car coat and the little glasses but ultimately, I got to go with Jose Cardinal. I think uh, the, the, the <laughs> Afro, he sported the fact that he would chew leaves off uh, the Wrigley Ivy. Uh, I mean, that, that is, it doesn't get a whole lot funkier than that. Uh, and, and certainly he was, uh, uh, he, he was a very colorful and interesting player. So, so he gets the nod. And then uh, I, I have to throw in a utility player, uh, which would be Lenny Randall, because he wasn't, really an all-star at any position, but played a lot of them. And the guy actually uh, waxed his own uh, uh, early 80s funk track, Kingdom, and certainly uh, had a lot of, uh, uh, was either part of or uh, was the cause of a lot of uh, uh, craziness uh, during the 70s. So I, I think he belongs on this team. I, th I think uh, many people, could probably, uh, well, I'm going to say in terms of a starting pitcher, there are almost two guys that just jump out with so much funky credit. It's not even funny, but. Uh, oh, I've got a five-man rotation. I was just going to say, now it's the 70s, so maybe a four-man, right. but we'll take five. Right. Well, you know, just in case uh, somebody gets hurt. Well, Doc Ellis, obviously. That's, yes. there's, there's no question that he, he is. Uh, he, he is on, in this rotation, but Louis Tiant, I think, has to be on there as well. I think the, you know, first of all, his his many, uh, his array of many crazy windups uh, is on there. And then the Monsanto toupee that he had specially commissioned with his uh, his World Series share in 1975, I think, uh, 
uh, you know, he was going bald, but he had a, a sort of uh, Afro toupee built for him out of uh, synthetic fiber. Uh, so, so yeah, he should be on there. Vita Blue, uh, not one, but two different funk songs were uh, named after him uh, during his initial uh, his, his initial burst of fame, and that wind up of his, uh, you know, truly funktastic. So he's on there. Uh, Mark the Bird Fidrich uh, is our fourth starter. I think, you know, he, he had the hair, he had uh, his, his mound behavior, the talking to the ball, the dropping to the mound to, to manicure it himself. Uh, and certainly his whole like, you know, life loving attitude uh, uh, that he brought a lot of funky joy to, to the ballpark during his brief career. And then of course, you gotta, you gotta wedge Bill Lee in there somewhere as spaceman, uh, certainly the only pitcher of the era to actually go on record with with the press uh, about his marijuana usage and uh, I, I think well he and uh, he and doc might not have uh, might not get along so well on the same uh, same staff I think he's got to be on there and then I've got two guys for for relief pitcher um, uh, as, as a right-handed closer we've got Don Stanhouse, Stan the Man Unusual, was certainly one of the greatest baseball nicknames of all time. And, and he had a pretty serious uh, perma pro. And then, uh, you know, coming out of the bullpen as a left-hander, Sparky Lyle, because, you know, he had the, that walrus uh, stash, but also his, his uh, fixation with sitting on the birthday cakes of other ballplayers, uh, that's pretty funky. So, uh, uh, you know, as, as the, as would be the cake after he sat on it. So, uh, I think Sparky's, uh, the last man on the roster. No, I've actually got a couple other spots to fill. You, you right. gave us our DH was Oscar Gamble. So, uh, no arguments there, obviously. Um, but this is the 1970s. We do need to carry a pinch runner on the roster. Do you have one? For oh, us? well, you know, I would, I guess my initial impulse would be Herb Washington, uh, you know, this, this is set all sorts of records for, you know, stealing bases and doing absolutely nothing else on the field. But I'm going to give it to Larry Lintz just because I think he's a he's one of the uh, A's designated runners who never gets a lot of cred. And the one time I ever went to see the A's play, which was against the Red Sox in 77, uh, he gave me his autograph before the game. So I'm going with Larry Lintz. Beautiful. One one last question related to this team, right? I mean, boy, would this be a fun team to go watch, right? Well, uh, somebody's got to own it. Uh, might this be a Chicago-based owner? I or think it's there gonna, even be a second place. Well, I think it's got to be Vec. Um, yeah, Bill Vec. You know, when when I moved to Chicago at the end of '79, I moved I moved from Los Angeles, and my intention was to become a White Sox fan because, excuse me, I, I absolutely loved Bill Vec. I'd, I'd, I think I'd been to Chicago only a couple of times and never been to Comiskey or anything, but I was so, every, I devoured every article I could read on him. I, I uh, you know, read, read the uh, early version of Vec is in wreck. I just thought he was the coolest dude. And, you know, unfortunately, I wound up on the north side. Uh, so, you know, just kind of became a, a Cubs fan by uh, uh, osmosis, really. But, but yeah, I, I was so excited to go to Comiskey and, you know, hopefully run into Bill Beck. Of course, I never did. But yeah, he, he, would, be my, he would be my team owner. I think, you know, uh, by the same token, a lot of, I, I'm a big Ted Turner fan, at least, you know, as he, in his incarnation as the Braves owner in the you know uh, last half of the '70s, I think he he really had a vision um, that he followed through on. I mean, he you know here was this guy who knew absolutely nothing about baseball, but knew how to get people interested in his team and knew how to get people coming out to the ballpark. And by the early '80s, he actually somehow built the Braves into, you know, a team that people cared about uh, in Atlanta and elsewhere. And also I, I spent a lot of summers in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So the, the team, so I could see 
uh, Braves games pretty much every night or afternoon of the week, which was so exciting to me as a kid in the 70s, you know, used to, you know, only being able to see Monday night baseball and game of the week. And that was it, you know, but but I could watch the Braves and, and the Braves were terrible. And and Atlantis, you know, the, the Atlanta stadium just like gave off this sort of sepulchral echo, like no one was there. And you could hear, you know, hear the ball hit the bat and and all this, but you could see them play good teams. So it was you know, so I, 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 I feel like I have to thank Ted Turner for, you know, giving me such a good baseball fix in the last half of the 70s. But it was, ultimately, I would still go with Bill Beck. Well, I thought we had rounded out our roster. And then uh, my friend John in the audience reminded me, we need a mascot, Dan. Ooh. You know, San Diego chicken. I, I again, I'm, I... I, I'm personally biased because I met the chicken uh, when he was uh, handing out postcards of himself as a promo for uh, the KGB, the radio station he was he was originally involved with uh, at a uh, at a softball diamond where near where my other grandparents lived in San Diego, and and I was shy. I didn't want to go meet the chicken, but my grandmother said my grandmother insisted that I shake hands with the chicken. And uh, so I did, and he gave me a postcard. And, you know, yeah, he, he uh, stands really uh, beak and uh, shoulders above all other mascots of the era. <laughs> That's outstanding. <laughs> Bill, I'm thinking we turn it to audience questions. What do you think? Or do you still Absolutely. Have Works yeah. for me. Okay, then let's try this. I think uh, Probably to minimize the chaos, if you've got a question for Dan, maybe type it into the chat and I'll try to moderate. Uh, so far, I, I don't think we have ones that came in earlier. Am I right, Bill? Do you see? Yeah, that? I don't. Just, just yeah. comments on my shirt. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, yeah, or or if, if we think it could work, if somebody wants to come off mute and just throw out a question too. And Dan, I should ask, because you've been generous with your time. Are you good for another five or so? Yeah, or? yeah, we, we can go, we could go another 10. Okay. Um, we're getting a comment from Phil. Pinch hitter, John, tonight, let it be Lowenstein. Well, yeah, yeah, John, John Lowenstein would definitely belong on this team uh, I think he was brother low as uh, as I knew him back then I think uh, you know both both with the Indians and with the Orioles he was a very uh, magnetic and funky figure uh, I think a lot of a lot of us Jewish kids were disappointed to find out later that he was not actually Jewish despite his his last name but, uh, yeah, he, he belongs on this team anyway Honorary member of the tribe, honorary exactly. member of the team. But I am, I am going to, I'm going to say, Phil, thank you because I'm documenting these choices, um, possibly for a Saber baseball cards article. If, if oh, that that would be that would be great. Uh, Joshua Burstein mentions Al Roboski. You know, I thought about I thought about the Mad Hungarian uh, as a reliever. Certainly, he had the stash, but I felt like so much of his shtick, you know, was based in anger. And anger to me is not a very funky thing. It's really, you know, I think uh, funk is about joy. And I never got a lot of joy from Al Roboski, to be honest. No, we got a question from Ronald. He wants to know, do you think Doc uh, was really on acid for the no-hitter? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, for a couple of reasons. One, um, as he tells it in his in his book and in the interviews that, that he did later in his life, he was, it wasn't like he dropped right before the game. He had been on acid for over a day uh, before that. And so he was, re he was not in like, I don't know if any of you have ever done acid, but uh, he was not in the really intense phase of the trip. He was, experiencing and also he had he had taken Dexamil to kind of get himself psyched up for the games there's a I think he was really more speeding than he was tripping but as anyone who may have done acid could tell you uh, there are certainly par parts of the trip where even though you're doing okay by this point things will come back at you and sort of surprise you and and you know maybe you'll see Richard Nixon behind the plate. Uh, but I I also think that you know there's a lot of people, Bill Lee, for example, who claimed that 
Doc was lying about this. I think Doc was, you know, if you know anything about his life, he he got sober after he uh, retired from baseball and was very, very active uh, in AA, was very active in helping um, uh, prisoners, uh, you know, shake their substance abuse problems. And if you know anything about that, you're not, you know, it's really important if, if you're a recovering addict that you tell the truth about the things that you did, uh, even if they weren't the coolest. And I think certainly there's a lot of our culture that is like, yeah, that was cool. He pitched a, a no hitter on acid. You know, yeah, I think that's cool. But I think in a lot of ways, Doc was kind of ashamed of it he, because he didn't really, you know, he felt like this was his addict side sort of getting, you know, taking control. And in retrospect, he really didn't remember that much of the game or appreciate it the way he wished he could have. So I don't think, I don't think he, he lied about that. I think, you know, there was, there, there's too much there that, that makes it, that to me, it's like, no, that, that, that it really has uh, more than the ring of truth to it. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, Don, Don Zaminda is wondering about uh, Ron Bloomberg's uh, impressions of Bill Vett besides, hey, this guy can stop a line drive off my bat pretty easily. <laughs> uh, he really, he loved Bill Vett. He, he really, you know, I think, I think to him, I think Ron really regrets going to the White Sox. He really wishes that he felt he was in sort of a no win position. Like he had to go somewhere else because, you know, what, what if, you know, he'd gotten badly injured two spring trainings in a row. What if he comes back for third spring training with the Yankees? runs into a wall again and he's out for this season again he he felt like you know it was ground groundhog day he was you know he he couldn't put himself in that position again so chicago is really the next best thing because it's a big city there's a jewish big jewish community and you know and and he loved bill beck he he spent a lot of time with him uh really loved um you know how worldly Vec was and Vec was so so different than Steinbrenner where it was just you know Steinbrenner always had this sort of combative dominant energy and Vec was just like you know come sit with me let's talk about stuff we could talk about baseball we could talk about whatever and you know I think he he, he felt kind of like you know if if George was a second father to him then Bill Vec was kind of like his you know his favorite uncle. <laughs> <laughs> how about a, a non-baseball question sure. uh tapping into the music side favorite metal band uh favorite metal band uh um wow um i mean i've been going through a pretty heavy pretty heavy iron maiden phase uh these last couple of years but i would say probably it all comes back to black sabbath um they you know that they so much came out of what they you know the template they put down and um yeah i can go back to those first four first six black sabbath albums anytime and still get something new out of them okay. um phil phil Lerar, uh is asking about wilbur wood in the rotation i think you know will wilbur I don't know how funky Wilbur was. I think, you know, he, he was certainly an amazing pitcher and, and, you know, the, like the, 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 I think the two halves of a double header thing is sort of overblown because he didn't do very well in either half. Uh, but, uh, but, the, but there's no question that the man racked up a ridiculous amount of innings uh, in the first half of the seventies. And, and, you know, and I do love a good knuckleball. So, yeah, I, I guess I guess we have to find a way to to, to bring Wilbur Wood in somehow. Steve Dunn notes uh, he bumped into Jose Cardinal at Cubs fantasy camp and asked him why he got rid of his famous Afro. And Jose said it was it was either that or his marriage. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I, I really I met I've been to Cubs fantasy camp a couple of times and I met met. Uh, talked a bit to, to Jose and yeah, he's still a total character. I, I remember like uh, there was one day was like after, after the games and we somehow it was just me and him both shaving in, in the, uh, in the locker room. And, and he's like, how you doing, man? I was like, man, this is, this is, 
this, this, is, this is rough, you know, it's like playing two games a day, you know, I was in my mid forties at the time. It's just like, you know, I guess it's like running a marathon. It's like, it's like, you run a lot of marathons. I was just, I was just looked at him. I was like, Jose, do I look like I run a lot of marathons? So yeah, just, just, uh, just really uh, did different way of looking at the world. Uh, Jose Carnell, but beautiful, beautiful cat. Uh, Maxwell asked about 70s athletes and other sports uh, assuming the roles of characters in uniform, for example, the Broad Street Bullies and the New York Cosmos. Why do you think this didn't present itself as often in baseball? Mad Hungarian is a good example. You know, I, I think I think there were a lot of characters in baseball, but I, I don't think, uh, you know, I, I think the South Side Hitmen might be an example of, you know, the, or, the, or the Pittsburgh Lumber Company may be an ex good examples of, you know, players having a collective character identity. But I think, you know, that was, uh, those, both of those were probably more imposed upon them by, you know, PR, the team's PR or team's journalists than the players themselves. As to why, I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think it's, it's you know, I, I think maybe it's just one of those things where like, you know, you get so many different personalities on a team and, you know, I guess the Bronx too uh, would be another, but again, that was sort of uh, um, an example of, of just, you know, of the chaos. Uh, the, the team is a, a character of chaos rather than a, as a specific team. So, yeah, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure why that is, I think, uh, but it is an interesting question you asked. Is there a, uh, a, another song title or 70s lyric that you'd love to turn into a book title? Oh, uh, well, that would be telling, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I will, well, yes, I will say that I have, I still have w at least one more 70s book left in me that, that I want to write someday. Uh, and there are, and I'm still look. I'm still trying to match up a good it's about a specific season and i'm still trying to match up a good song from that era and now that we're talking about it actually i think i may have thought of one but that's oh. about as much as i can reveal so thank you for uh thank you for getting the wheels turning on that <laughs> we'll go back here. and cite this when the book comes out yeah okay? exactly it's like <laughs> man oh man well bill uh before we, I think, close and thank Dan, are there any chapter announcements we need to uh, yes. share with the world? Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, the next event is actually Sabre's 19th century grave marker project. Uh, <laughs> quite a transition. Yeah, uh, no, I'm into it. The 19th century. So if you can join us on Saturday, November 6th at 1 p.m., we'll be meeting at Rose Hill Cemetery in Chicago for the dedication of the Ed Williamson grave marker. Uh, he was buried in an unmarked grave, so be there at one o'clock, and we're gonna try to work out a uh, either Facebook Live or Zoom to, to broadcast that to people. Obviously, weather uh, might be an issue, but it's gonna be rain or shine or snow or freezing cold, so we'll be out there. So uh, it's not so much a, a, a chapter event as it is that project, but we're gonna, join hands on that one uh, since it's in Chicago so that that's also awesome. Rose Hill was one of my favorite places to go uh, take a walk uh, when I lived this last uh, last few years in Chicago and and uh, I know that there are a lot of there's that there's there's more than a few 19th century ball players buried there correct mm -hmm. yeah, I think so so yeah. Uh, yeah no that's that's I wish I could be there for it <laughs> we'll get you a video <laughs> right on <laughs> well I think where we are then is, let me say, Dan, thank you very much. Oh, I think thank you, thank one you of our, guys. Our, our most fun discussions, dare I say most funky uh, as well. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for writing the book, for coming here, sharing it with us. And- uh, <laughs> Makes a great Christmas or Hanukkah gift. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. If, if people haven't picked mine out yet, I'm good with one for each day. Um, I still need stars and strikes, by the way. So anyways, I, you know, maybe seven, seven captains, one stars. But um, so thank you for that. And for the audience, thank you so much for being here. We'll probably have this up on the YouTube Sabre thing in a couple of days. If 
if you want to rewatch. And then Dan, I'm going to connect with you about turning your team into a little baseball card lineup. Uh, oh, for, that, for the blog. That's it's outstanding. Cool. I can't wait. Beautiful. Everybody hey. have, have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. It's been a pleasure.